Good evening and uh, welcome to the Legatum Institute. My name is Christina Rodone. I'm the Director of Communications here. And tonight I am delighted for uh, us to host a conversation between two giants of, um, of today, Tim Montgomery and Dag Detter, who is the author of The Public Wealth of Nations. Uh, they're both my friends, so forgive their hyperbole. Um, but before I hand over to the gentleman, uh, I just wanted to have a few words about the Legatum Institute. We are an international think tank and educational charity, and we promote prosperity through revitalizing capitalism and democracy, which we do through a series of programs, including our Prosperity Index, which ranks 142 countries around the world in terms of wealth and well-being, and through Tim Montgomery's vision of capitalism, which will deliver an agenda to the next government, whichever shade of political persuasion it might be, um, on how to restore our faith in the free market. Now, um, I jokingly said that these are two giants, but uh, it cannot have escaped anybody who has been living in Britain over the last 10 years that one of the, our greatest social entrepreneurs is Tim Montgomery who founded the conservative home website and has become a, a Times columnist and political commentator par excellence. And we are honored at the Legatum Institute to have made him our senior fellow, one of a few. Um, Dag Detter is a Swede. He's an expert in, uh, public, in, in restructuring of public assets. And he is the author of the forthcoming bombshell bestseller, <laughs> The Public Wealth of Nations. I am sure you will um, welcome them both. And um, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Christina, for that very warm and very generous um, introduction. And thank you very much, everyone, for coming this evening. And um, you may think you are here for an interview between me and Dag about important uh, public policy issues, but actually you're wrong. This is a revivalist meeting. This is almost like an evangelistic call to action at the end. We'll be asking people to come forward and commit their lives to this mission because the brief conversation I've already had with Dag, Dag really, really believes that what he's got here in this analysis of the public wealth of nations is incredibly important for the future of public policy, for addressing so many of our issues, particularly in the advanced world, very indebted world when it comes to the public sector. And I hope that uh, as I've been reading through um, the materials that he's written, I've become more and more excited, intrigued as well. I'm going to try and put some of my doubts as well as my excitements to him in the time that we have um, together. And after I've asked a few questions, we will open it up for all of you to be able to express your opinions um, as well. But um, uh, thank you so much, Dag, for sparing thank some you. time to to be with us. And um, let me begin with this uh, quote from one of your papers. Global public wealth could generate more than all countries' total spending on infrastructure, transport, power, water, and communications if managed professionally. You say that the value of global public assets exceeds all global public debt. This is a big potatoes prospectus you're um, sharing with us. Yes, you need a big number to, to create attention. So that's, that's the first um, objective with, with such a number, of course. Give us, give us your number. Some 75 are... trillion US dollar is the value that we have come up with in, in the book that we are about to publish uh, later this, this spring. And that, uh, that number represents the value of commercial assets in the central <laughs> government level. And that's a book value. So the market value, at least in the developed nations or in, in nations where uh, you're not in a deflationary stage so, <coughs> or a financial crisis, the market value of that number will most likely be much higher. And also, uh, it's um, only the central government, so regional and uh, local governments, where, which is really where the, the, uh, the substantial part of the wealth is, like the tip of the iceberg, uh, is not in that number. So the, what does the number cover? What are these public commercial assets that you mean? These are roads, land, forestry, 
Public and, buildings? Yes, anything that can generate an income or be uh, given a market value. So anything that is financed by, by tax is not in there. So we're not talking about sweating the, the 10 Downing Street or the, the White House or Yellowstone National Park, etc. Although we could be, we could charge fees to go well, visit yes. <laughs> So what are the ones that you think are most undervalued in your experience of looking at these issues? Which are the ones that government manages least well for in the public interest at the moment? Well, the, 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 the first problem is that we actually don't know what these assets are. Mm. That is the biggest problem. So the transparency is extremely low. And not even the governments themselves uh, really do know what they own. So normally when, unfortunately, uh, governments only pay attention to this when there is a crisis. And that's when uh, people like myself and others <coughs> come to try to help. And what you normally discover is that they have a fairly good understanding of the corporate assets that mm -hmm. are visible, sometimes even listed, uh, and quite visible to the, to the, um, to the consumers. In other words, electricity, airlines, uh, and so forth. But the most uh, intransparent asset uh, segment is real estate, yeah. which is often also two-thirds of the portfolio. And two-thirds that is very much hidden, mm -hmm. even to the government themselves. And so one of the, um, in your paper, you talk particularly about how forestry has been undervalued in the US context. Tell us a little bit more about the, the literature that you've observed on, on that as an example of an asset that the public sector has, has yes, not managed I mean, well. Yes, forestry is a, is a, is a very interesting um, asset, partly because governments traditionally own very large segments of it. And in Europe and in former Eastern Europe, or uh, former Soviet Union, uh, governments traditionally have 100% of all the forests. In the U.S., the government, U.S. government ha is, a, is a very large owner. Federal government has uh, uh, substantial uh, assets in this uh, segment, but also uh, the federal, uh, sorry, the states. And, and uh, there is a very famous um, article by Fukuyama in Foreign Affairs that has gone through how uh, inefficient this is managed and how much value is lost through this very bureaucratic management. And we have other examples in Europe, and one that I've mentioned in, in the, I think in the article, and at least in the book, is uh, where the government of Lithuania wanted to look at their forestry assets and found that they were actually 30 times less efficient than even their neighbor in Latvia, mm. and, of, uh, and also in Sweden, where. And one of the reasons for this was quite peculiar or very interesting was that the Lithuanians immediately said, well, you can't compare us with other countries because, you know, we, we have a different history, etc." But when it came up that even Latvia, which has a very identical, not identical, but very similar history, um, was more efficient for the simple reason that they had consolidated all their assets under one company, while the Lithuanians had 64, I think, um, companies and they were in themselves divided into several hundred companies, all with their different management and, and uh, staff, etc. Which was the operational cost uh, for that came to, you know, was incomparable to somebody who had consolidated this under one management. Mm. And in your article, you talk about sort of a phony battle between private and state control, and you say the most important thing really is about the management of these assets. Is, is that r quite true? Because one of the examples you, you give is you talk about you know, the massive sh exploitation of shale oil reserves and shale gas reserves in the US by private landowners. And note how all that shale, those shale reserves are under public sector land as well, but there hasn't been anything like the same exploitation. If you're a private owner of land, you have the incentives to maximize the return of whatever your assets you have. Doesn't actually ownership absolutely matter in whether a, a resource is managed properly or not? Of course it does. I mean, it, I mean we, we see that bec between private sector owners as well. Um, you have differences between private equity and, and, and listed companies or when listed companies have uh, totally anonymous shareholders, etc. 
and that's what shareholder activism and, and uh, the whole uh, shareholder revolution since the 1970s has been all about. Mm. So of course ownership matters a lot. Um, but what I would like to, or what we in the book would like to strike um, a chord for is that we should try at least to stop talking about ownership when it comes to these assets because we have been locked into a phony war for the last 25 or maybe even 50 years. And that has not resulted in anything else but left these assets completely intransparent and unknown to the actual owners, the taxpayers. Uh, and, and this is what I think uh, you know, we are trying to change. Mm -hmm. So if we could leave that debate to the side, <coughs> and because there's no way that we are going to, uh, one, we're not gonna solve that debate. Number two, we're not, even if we decide privatization is the only goal, we're not going to be able to privatize 75 trillion or 300 trillion dollars worth of assets. There's no way. So what better is, you know, if we could have, if every country had a national register, if every citizen instead demanded that we want to know how, many, how much asset we own, and instead of just uh, pushing for austerity or raising the debt levels, trying to sweat the assets and have that as a supplement to the budget mm -hmm. or a way of, of uh, um, paying down the debt. And uh, actually it would also uh, mean a lot of structural reforms in the country because these are very important assets. Yeah. I mean, real estate sector aside, governments normally own very, very important assets in network industries, electricity, energy, uh, transportation, post offices, etc. Yeah. So having the, those managed and, and run more commercially, professionally, is crucial for the economy of every nation. I want to, I want to come back to this point about transparency because it seems crucial to your yes. argument. But I just want to press you a little bit further on this privatization issue because I get the sense, you know, we, we linking the discussion we had about forestry issues, I don't know if you followed the debate we had in the UK um, yes, yes, recently, yes. but the government wanted to privatise forests, thought they'd be better managed, the taxpayer would make more of a profit if they were in private hands, and the public hated the idea. So I can understand your scepticism. We've had a practical example here in the UK of, of the public worrying about that. And in, and in your article, you talk about the dangers of cronyism and inequality potentially growing if you privatise thoughtlessly. You, you, you do seem worried about privatization more than just as in terms of a phony debate, but you seem slightly worried about where it might lead. Yes, I mean, I, I think we should, I'd like to put the UK aside because that is an exceptional country. It's probably the most, it's, it's, it is the, the most sophisticated country managing these things for various reasons. I would say that Sweden, um, Finland, Austria, you know, uh, Singapore is extremely sophisticated as well. Yeah. But they lack one, you know, they lack the, the financial center that the UK has, mm -hmm. which is unique in the world. Um, um, because the US don't have that sophistication when it comes to managing state assets, yeah. like the UK has. And also you have a civil society which is able to debate this. Mm -hmm. So what you have done uh, in, in this context is unique. Um, so if, we, if we, so if we put that aside for two minutes, I'll come back to the U I'll happily come back to the UK because there, there's a lot to, to say still about the UK. But in a normal society where you don't have this extremely developed financial uh, and civil society, it is very difficult to privatize. And if you really want to see this from a democratic perspective or, or, or accountability f uh, perspective, it is very important that you start managing these assets first because it's so easy to privatize these things unleveraged. Uh, uh, I mean, if you would ask a, a financial um, astute person, would he ever sell an asset without putting leverage on it? I mean, that, that would never happen. Mm -hmm. Or developing it as much as they can, at least. Yeah. And, and so that's really the point. And the government is by definition almost, in, incapable of developing commercial assets. And that's why we are suggesting this National Wealth Fund, which is uh, outsourcing the management of commercial assets, almost like you're doing with the, uh, the monetary policy to a central bank. So you're separating, you're insulating that kind of decision-making from the short-term political 
influence. So the politicians should be running the country and the, and the manager of a, of a national wealth fund should be running the commercial assets. Yep. But that's when we, first of all, we have to agree that these are commercial assets. We're, we're limi limiting the whole discussion to commercial assets. Yep. And the m some of the most important commercial assets in any country is land. Yes. And you have tried, back to your transparency point, you have tried to establish as someone as private citizen interested in this subject the nature of the land assets, the commercial land assets that, say, a country like the UK owns, and it's an uphill struggle. It is, it is. Because, I mean, it, it, first of all, the government doesn't even have a register, which is, I think, is, is very strange. So the government, let alone you trying to know the nature of these assets, the government doesn't know really no. what it owns. And, 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 I mean, if you were a private person, you will tell the IRS that I, I, I don't know the... Uh, the um, extent of my assets. I mean, you would probably go to jail in the end. <laughs> a corporation, even, even more so, um, that CEO wouldn't you know, last very long. No. Um, but the governments all over the world, uh, there's not one government in the world who actually has a register of their assets. Not even Singapore, who, seem, who seems to well, be a bit of a model for you. Well, well yes, probably Singapore, but, but uh, uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't know it f as an exact, mm. but they they do have an integrated holding company, both for the real estate and, and for their corporate assets. Mm. So what, sh what should, in terms of knowing the nature of these assets, what steps would an enlightened government begin so that it starts going down the road to where it can start managing its assets well? Because if it doesn't know what it has, it can't begin to put these semi-autonomous organizations in place that you, Bank of England type, Federal Reserve type institutions, to start managing these assets well? Yeah, I mean, the, f the first thing is to, uh, in my view, I is, is to consolidate the asset, the ownership management. So um, if, if you think of a, 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 a central bank, I they are in complete control of their mandate. And the same thing with a sovereign wealth fund, they are managing um, the, the liquid assets of a, of a, of a, of a country. And then a national wealth fund is basically, the difference between a national wealth fund and a sovereign wealth fund, this is a concept that we have introduced, is uh, we see the sovereign wealth fund being more like a hedge fund manager. They're managing liquid assets. While uh, a national wealth fund is more like a private equity um, manager managing operational assets. Yeah. So that they need to be consolidated under one hat, under one command. That is the most important. And then the next thing is the transparency uh, w once you have that, it's much more easy to have a register, a proper register, with proper private sector accounting, not public sector. Because these are commercial assets. Mm -hmm. Once you recognize that they are commercial assets, they should also be treated with the same um, framework as the, the private sector commercial assets. They shouldn't have separate accounting, separate management, mm -hmm. separate uh, managers or incentive system, etc. So in your paper, you mentioned Austria, you mentioned Finland as countries that have begun to go down this road, but Singapore seems to be the poster country so far in managing these commercial assets. Tell us what attracts you about the Singapore model and perhaps tell us, could it be a model for the UK or is there aspects of it that you don't like that we could make it, we could do better? I, I obviously think that the, the Singapore model is, is, is definitely a model for, for all developed nations. Um, and I, well, we should, we should make a, we should stress developed nations because there is a difference between, uh, I'd like to quote Fukuyama who has uh, written this splendid book called Political Order, which I think is a good way of putting it. Uh, if you, if a country has political order, it depends on three things. It, it depends on a strong state, accountability, and the rule of law. <clears throat> and for the countries that have this, I think it's you know, quite possible to follow a, a, a model like uh, Singapore. And they clearly set out, which was the vice premier, premier in 1974, he said that you know, a, a politician should run the country. And then we should have businessmen to run our um, commercial assets, mm -hmm. and and that's why they isolated them and put them out on a on a uh, on a holding company, and this should be self-evident. But it comes down. Sorry for repeating myself, but I find this 
being some, somewhat of a uh, clinch uh, word here. This is commercial assets. Once the society recognize that these are commercial assets, we're not trying to, you know, let's not include anything that could be mildly gray zone or mildly sensitive from a polit political perspective. Uh, then it's much <coughs> easier to talk about it in this way. And how worried are you about these semi-autonomous institutions having too much power? You're worried about the state undervaluing or misusing resources. You talk in your paper about Amtrak in the, in the USA having to serve all sorts of con congressional districts that probably wouldn't justify on economic grounds because the congressmen want them. We've already mentioned your worry about essentially private sector ownership, uh, taking an asset that isn't properly valued in the in the first place and maybe cronyism emerging. How, the, the amount, you know, you begin with the, your <coughs> estimate of these, the value of these commercial assets and yet you want to trust these semi-autonomous organizations with potentially the oversight of enormous, enormously important assets. How do we look after these? How do we ensure that the Mervyn Kings and the Mark Carneys of this world don't start causing a different set of problems? Singapore is always put up as an example of great public administration, but it's, it's, it, there's pl it's always used, and there are many other examples of countries where the uh, dictatorship is perhaps not quite so benevolent. Yes. Um, we mustn't get into a discussion about Singapore, but... No, 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 it's, it's got, it's, that, that's, why I call, that's why I like to call it... That's why I like Fukuyama's term, political order, because he's not, making, he's not discussing whether the degree of democracy. He's di di discussing the degree of political order, which requires these three things. So as long as we have that, I mean, if, if we're talking about countries where there's no strong state, where there's you know, rampant crony capitalism, this idea might be more difficult. Mm. Uh, and and, and uh, I still have a, you know, the, the, it's still, the jury is still out whether it could be a tool to help such a country develop a strong state and develop democracy, et cetera. But if we leave that aside, if we assume that it is that we do have political order, I mean, uh, the trick is to set up the checks and balances as we have with the military, as we have we have a we have a supreme commander of a military, we have a supreme commander for a central bank. I mean, these are not small responsibilities; mm. these are not petty responsibilities, and neither is running a national wealth fund. Mm. And the the thing that sort of often trips up. Um, these organizations in the UK, as you call a sort of an advanced nation with a thoughtful civil society, but the pay that people get, the pay that the state-owned Royal Bank of Scotland, you know, the chief executive got is a subject of enormous public controversy. You, you're still going to have the problem with these organizations being part, even at arm's length, being part of the <coughs> political debate and potentially political manipulation. Well, less. I, m my view is... My, my, my experience is you're going to have less of a problem because the more political insulation, I mean, I have basically copied uh, Fukuyama's or, or uh, done a similar thing for, for national wealth funds, if you like, or for managing of commercial assets, which is the three components you need to make this work is, is um, political insulation, transparency, and a clear objective. And as with Fukuyama's political order, uh, they work together. And, and the sequence is, is, is extremely important. And if you make one weaker, the whole system is going to not collapse, but it's going to be, it, it's going to be dysfunctional. Yeah. So having, a, having completely political insulation but, but no transparency, yes, the management is going to run away with the assets. And it's going to, we're going to have a new form of uh, crony capitalism. Okay. And if they have... Uh, like you had holding companies that you could call national wealth funds in Italy in the 70s, and actually they were created by Mussolini in the 30s, but they survived the war, etc. And they were, IRI and INI became the largest uh, holding companies in the world. And they have the wrong objective because they had um, an empl uh, un employment as their objective. Yeah. And it became an absolute uh, uh, catastrophe. So these three has to work together. Yeah. And it'd be very important to have a, a large number of these arm's length bodies so that there wasn't too much power concentrated. So you have different models of how these public assets could be Well, I, I, I would actually developed. argue for, for that, that you have one, uh, for the central government should only have one, 
yeah. and not several. I mean, there's a great temptation. Once you manage to con uh, convince a government about this, they love to create several because then they can give the chairmanship to d various friends, etc. Mm. But, but you know, th this is again. I think the concentration of this is very important because you, you have this one person, and he or she is in the spotlight, and 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 everybody's looking at. Um, it's very centralized, though. What if this person gets it wrong? Why can't you have a number of subdivisions where you can see different well, models will. of management? You will have under, yeah. underneath. I mean, you. I mean, like you will. Have, we have representatives from the from the financial sector here and from private equity. I mean, every private equity who are uh, who doesn't have a complete focus on one segment have you know portfolios of you know real estate. And they have a management team under that who are very, very you know, very specialized and very professional. Mm. And then you have, you know, maybe industrial of some sort, etc. And and so of course, like any holding company, you would have, you know, sub holdings or whatever underneath that mm. could be very specialized. Okay. But to uh, divide and conquer, which is you know a, a favorite thing among politicians for for various reasons, I think. Uh, and there's also economies of scale. Because countries, unless you're the U.S. or China, uh, when you're going to the capital markets to 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 um, get um, bond financing, etc., the economies of scale uh, of a centralized holding is it has a lot of benefits. Okay. Well, I'm going to throw it open to the audience in a minute, but I, a tough final question for you. I don't know whether you can see, but we've got Barack Obama over there. We've got David Cameron in the second row over there, <laughs> and we've got Angela Merkel there, and they're wanting to you to give them some political advice. How can they, they're all worried about re-election, or some of them are worried about re-election. Um, what would you say is the next most important step that they can do? You're an evangelist for this project. How do they turn this big idea into political gold? Well, there is actually a, some research, if you turn to uh, academic, that, uh, academia, that has shown that uh, countries that re reform actually can get re-elected. Re so what Juncker said, we all know what to do, but yes. not how to get re-elected, yeah. has actually been proven by some academics, at least, to, to, uh, to be untrue. Uh, you just have to have the guts. And, but also, communication here is extremely important. If you can't communicate, you know, one, we have a problem, two, you know, there is a solution, and it's going to benefit you. So what th today, you have a huge uh, asset base that is equivalent maybe to your GDP, which is roughly the number, the rule of thumb in every country. And that is benefiting, you know, you can call the greedy 300. And, and uh, the trick is for the prime minister to turn that in from the greedy 300 to the, to the you know, uh, the, uh, the, the happy 50 million in the UK or the happy 300 million in the US. Yeah. And some, of the, some people will be watching our interview on video <coughs> at different times. If they want to find more information about your ideas, what should they put into their search engine to, to see what you've been writing? Public Wealth of Nations. Public Wealth of Nations. Dag Dutta, thank you very much thank you. indeed.